Hi, my name is Michael Dowling, everyone. I live um, in South Boston. It's great to follow Gail on a panel, let me tell you. Because I moved to South Boston a little over 30 years ago, sort of at the heat and the height of busing, and lived on a street right across from the high school in South Boston. And every day would watch those buses go by my house, surrounded by about 400 police officers. And at the top of my hill, there was a section that was marked off for the press. And uh, so the press was there on a, on a pre pretty regular basis. And I was uh, teaching at BU right around that time and had uh, a party at the end of the year for my students. And I remember inviting two, uh, getting a cab for two young black women and having them duck down in the back of the cab to get safely into South Boston. And, so, and then getting them back in the cab. Uh, and they were on their way back to BU. And that day, the John Wilson sculpture of Martin Luther King was being unveiled in front of Marsh Chapel. Right? Just this moment in history where still, you know, in my lifetime, and in many of our lifetimes, you know, you had to put somebody in a cab and duck down. And, you know, I, I'm white, I'm Irish, I grew up Catholic, you know, and so South Boston, I could pass. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and, you know, but I lived there with my boyfriend. So it wasn't so easy. And for six years, you know, we passed because we lived in a very quiet house. And I moved around the corner to the house where I now live. And um, suddenly we're in a fishbowl. And people saw us come, they saw us go. And my hatred for the people of South Boston began to really grow. You know, sort of redneck, homophobic, racist, you know, Every, everything negative, every negative stereotype that you could call a community, you know, I, I really embraced. And uh, in 1992, I think it was, there was a group marching in the St. Patrick's Day Parade. They called themselves GLIB, Gay, Lesbian, Irish, Bisexual Pride Committee. And um, they were surrounded by about 400 police officers coming up my street. And I'm having this flashback. And I'm thinking, oh my God, it's happening again. And my friend Rob Cutler, who's been accused of having autism, and I had decided that we would hand out pink roses to these marchers as they went by my house. And this woman who was in charge of it, so I said, no, don't come out because it was a really tough day. And you know, as parades are, they have a way of stalling, and the parade goes by my house. And Rob Cutler picked up the bucket of roses and broke through the police line. My mother, my dad, my nieces, my nephews, all of us walked down the street and handed pink roses to a group of marchers who just dissolved on the street at that moment. And I have to tell you, it was a feeling like no other feeling I'd ever experienced in my life. And the next week, every window in my house was broken. And I would repair a window, and the window would be broken. I would repair a window, and the window would be broken. And I thought, you know, I've hated these people for too long. I hate them much more than they think or care or know about me. And I have kept my gift of citizenship, of community, from them. And instead, I've jammed politics down their throats. So I wrote an open letter to my neighbors that day and said, you know, I've lived here now for 17 years. These windows are being broken. I believe it's a hate crime. I think I know who's done it. I have told the police about it. And I handled it with a letter to 100 houses in every direction from my house <coughs> with my big dog beside me. <laughs> and as I was going back to the house, a man came running up with a letter. Mr. Crowley, is, this is wrong, this is wrong. And I'm thinking that he's thinking that I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. right? and he says, you are a good neighbor. This is wrong. That day, the windows stopped being broken. Mm -hmm. And that day, I decided that I needed to make amends to my community that the way to be part of community was to join it. And as an artist, I could 
rail against the things I hated about that community, where I could witness the loss, the sense of, of, of uh, being disempowered, the sense of uh, not knowing, and I could give the gift of and, and create a threshold for people to, to walk through and maybe change things. So I invited my neighborhood to join me at this little abandoned site. I know my two minutes. Left. <laughs> and uh, on August 16th, this is 1996, it took me four years to figure out how to do this. Uh, and 300 neighbors showed up. And they showed up with a stone and a story of what connected them to South Boston. And they set those stones that day on that hill. And there those stones stay. So your stone is next to mine, and I can't stand you. But I like you, and your stone is also next to mine. <laughs> and this woman came up, and she was carrying a very large stone. And on the stone, it was a photograph of her son and some dates. And I said, I don't want that kind of stone to myself. And she got to the top of the stairs, and she says, you know, why are you doing this for us? You know, you were always taunted in the neighborhood. I said, well, I owe it to you. She said, well, this is a stone for my son, who was gay, who died from AIDS, who was teased his whole life growing up in South Boston. He played in this site. His stone belongs here. And I knew at that moment that by bearing witness as an artist, that things were possible, that a cultural action is different than community organizing. Mm -hmm. That community building has to happen first. To build community, I needed to join mine. So two years later, a group of young boys from South Boston and girls approached me about helping them with the grief. I know my two minutes is up. Helping them. Maybe two minutes away. Okay. <laughs> two more sentences. Do I get two more sentences? Yeah. Okay. Um, this group of young people called themselves selfie survivors. And they had survived uh, either suicide attempts or drug overdoses. I mean, people may know heroin is an epidemic in South Boston to this day, as is suicide, although not talked about anymore. And they asked if I would help them build a monument to their grief. People were really nervous about this because we don't want to romanticize suicide. We don't want to say, you kill yourself, you get a monument. So this was really, really scary to me. And every day I would go over and work with them and they would do nothing but just sit around. And, and they were talking one day about what girls could do and what boys could do. And it came down to, well, you know, boys can pee in the snow and write their names. And I had a wonderful book of Ozark Mountain Folk Tales, and the title was Pissing in the Snow. And I went and got it and read the title story. And your short stories are wonderful because there's always that little object lesson. I said, what is it that we want to do here? And they said, we want to be listened to. We want to be heard. We want to be witnessed. So all of my work in medicine, well, I now have 300 those young people working with me. <laughs> so that's the benefit of that. They may be the same ones that would have broken my windows in the past. But um, we had a, a very wise man in South Boston called Joe Mopley, who was our congressman for many years. And he said, you know, what you do locally has application, you know, regionally and then, be, then, then beyond. So um, I do have a short video, but I don't know, Max, if. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it took like seven after. minutes. Hey, you did a nice job on this. I know. Thanks. Anyway, thank you, everyone. Yeah.